Let's all pray together. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to be in your presence this morning. Father, it helps us after all the trials and tribulations that we deal with throughout the week. It helps us to come together, to sit with one another, to offer worship and praise to you. Father, it calms and strengthens our soul to take time to recognize that you are our God, that you are in control, that we can rely on you, and we don't have to rely on ourselves. Father, there are so many challenges we face in this world that we are helpless to deal with, that we don't have the ability or the power to cure or solve. And we're so grateful that we have a loving God who cares for us, who cared for us from the time that he created us. Father, we're so grateful for your son, Jesus Christ. We're so grateful that as we walk through this world, we know that our time in this world is limited and that we have a reward waiting after this world that you've promised and guaranteed through the blood of your son. Father, we are grateful. Father, at this time, we pray for the many members that we have here who have been on our prayer list and for the new ones that are being added to the prayer list. Father, we pray for Sister Dorothy. We pray that you'll help her to heal quickly. We pray for the Burkett family. We pray that you'll strengthen them as they deal with their loss. And Father, we pray that you'll watch over and protect the members of the family that'll be traveling home in the next few days. Father, we pray for this congregation. Father, we pray that you'll look at each and every one of us, that you'll see the needs that we have. We pray, Father, that our hearts will be open to your healing power and to the strength that you offer to us. Father, we thank you for your word and we pray that you will help us all, especially the members here, to rely on that word. Father, help us to dive deep into that word to find the consolation that is there, to find the strength that is there, and to find the guidance that is there. Father, help us to hold your word as precious and to make it part of us. Father, as we go through this service, we pray that we will have our minds and our hearts focused on you, that we'll think on all that you have done for us, that all you have done for everyone, that we will Focus on the fact that you are the great and eternal God and the loving creator of all that we have and are. And Father, we pray that you'll always receive the glory that you are deserving of. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning. Let's sing song number 33. That was song number three, three. And oh, so we praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah. Who has born? 
Next, let's sing song number 135. 135. No so on Zion's glorious summit stood a numerous host redeemed by blood. They killed their king in strains divine. I heard the song and strove to. song and stroke to join. Here all that suffered sword or flame for Jesus, for Jesus lovely name shall victory now and hail the Lamb and bow Next, let's sing song number 371. 371, during the song, we will prepare for communion.
Will you bow with me, please? Our Father in heaven, we humbly approach you this morning, thanking you for the many blessings that you provide to us. First and foremost, as we remember your son, Jesus, we're thankful for him and the love that he had for us and has for us, that he would give himself up for us, that we might have that hope to live eternally with you. Lord, as we partake of this bread, please help us to do so in a manner that's pleasing in your sight. Help us to think on the things that will make us right with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us continue in prayer. Father, we continue this memorial service for your son, Jesus, who so lovingly gave himself for us. We ask as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents his blood that was shed on the cross, that we do so in a manner Uh, worthy and understanding of all that was done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Next, let's sing song number 315, 315.
This time has been set aside to take up a collection for the saints. Will you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we approach you once again. Thank you for all the things that you provide to us in our lives. We're thankful for the creation. We're thankful for everything that makes this world work. We're most thankful for your son. We're thankful for your plan of salvation and the love that you have for us. We're so humbled by all the great things that you provide in our lives. At this time, Lord, as we give back, we ask that we do so with a cheerful heart as you commanded. Please be with the monies that are collected that it goes to the furtherance of your kingdom, that we can be the light in this community and help those all around the world to spread the gospel and the good news. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As they're finishing the collection, if you'd like to mark the song that will be after our lesson, that will be song number 513. 513. Our song before the lesson will be song number 269. That was 269. And also, as per request from Nathan, uh, immediately after the song, we'll sing one verse of Jesus Loves Me while we're still standing. So if, if it's not a burden to you, let's stand as we sing. Jesus loves me, this I know. 
The scripture reading this morning is 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Appreciate Jonathan taking that special request. Uh, that's a beautiful song, isn't it? It may be a children's song, but the sentiment of that song is precious to adults' hearts, isn't it? That was a song that was precious to me when I was a child. My parents taught me that song, and certainly people who loved me in the church taught me that song and sang that song with me. The sentiment of that song, Jesus Loves Me, was important to me when I was a child. When I was a child, I had fears. I had anxiety. When I was a child, there were things that I didn't understand. When I was a child, there were times when I felt alone and when I wanted comfort and when I needed help. And the sentiment of that song, Jesus Loves Me, this I know brought real comfort to my heart. And you know, as an adult, there are times when I have fear. There are times when I have anxiety. There are times when there are things that I don't understand. There are times when I need comfort. There are times when I need help. And the sentiment of that song still brings real comfort and joy to my heart. Jesus is the answer for my soul's needs. When I think about the problems that I face in life, the solution for those problems is this, Jesus loves me, this I know. These were thoughts that changed my life when I was a child. And they are thoughts which should really change our lives forever. Jesus loves me is a central and life-changing truth. This morning, we're going to consider that simple and life-changing truth. We're going to notice that this idea, Jesus loves me, is the answer for my soul's needs. It's the answer for my soul's problem of sin. It's the answer for my soul's need for a sacrifice. It's the answer for my soul's need for salvation. It is the answer for my soul's need for security. Jesus loves me. That's the answer. So consider with me first, Jesus loves me is the answer to my soul's problem of sin. When we think about the greatest problems that we face in this life, we get a lot of help thinking about them, don't we? Turn on the news and we'll find out about what our greatest problems are according to the news. Or talk with friends, before long we'll be talking about problems. We know that in life there are problems. Things like a pandemic, this isn't my greatest problem, it's a problem, but it's not my greatest problem. Economic difficulties, a problem, not my greatest problem. What is my greatest problem? It is not that I am unpopular or unloved or unappreciated or unknown. In fact, illness is not my greatest problem, nor is it the fact that one day you and I will die. Hebrews 9, 27 says, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. These are not our greatest problems. They're all problems, and they're serious problems. And I am sure they are problems we've all thought about in some degree in this past week, and perhaps even this morning. Man's greatest problem is the problem of sin. This is a problem for which we personally don't have an answer. It's a problem for all of us. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's a serious problem, more serious than any other because the wage of sin is eternal death, Romans 6.23. And it is a problem for which we in ourselves and of ourselves do not have a solution. The way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. Jeremiah 10, 23. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 14, 12. 
We do not have within ourselves the solution for this problem. We will not, by our wisdom, find the solution for this problem. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 1.21, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Human wisdom will not find for us the answer to the problem of sin. And it is our greatest problem. Since sin is our greatest problem, then our greatest need is a solution for the problem of sin. Jesus is the solution. Notice Romans 5, verses 6 through 11, which you'll see on the screen behind me. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Without the answer to the problem for our sin, we are hopeless. We are helpless. We are without happiness and we will miss heaven. But as Brother Andy read for us, Christ became poor so that we may be made rich. What does that mean? It means that he left all of the joys and blessings of heaven to live upon this earth and to die upon a cross so that one day we could leave all the difficulties and burdens of this earth and join him in the blessings of that heaven. Jesus and Jesus alone is the answer for the problem of our sin. It has been said that when Roman soldiers drove nails through his hands and through his feet, each stroke sounded out loudly and clearly, Jesus loves me. Jesus is the answer to my soul's problem of sin. But also, Jesus loves me, this idea is the answer to my soul's need for a sacrifice. According to the Bible, we must have a sacrifice for our sins. Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There must be a sacrifice for our sins so that our sins can be taken away so that we are held guilty by them no longer before God, so that we can be forgiven. And yet the Bible also says that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin, Hebrews 10, 4. We need a sacrifice that can take away sin. And yet there is no animal sacrifice which is sufficient to accomplish this great need. John the Baptist said of Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. Paul wrote, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Jesus and Jesus alone is the perfect sacrifice for our sins. God made him to be a sin offering for us who knew no sin so that we might be the, made the righteousness of God in him, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. It was for this reason that Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. Why? For the suffering of death, that through him we might have our forgiveness. He, by the grace of God, tasted death for every man. Jesus tasted death for you. And he tasted death for me. He lived a perfectly sinless life just so that he could die on the cross for our sins. Hebrews 4.15 says that he was in all points tempted like as we are, and yet he was without sin. We may wonder why 
Why was it that Jesus died on the cross for us? Why was it that we were given this great solution for our need for a sacrifice? And the answer is that God has given us life through the blood of Jesus Christ shed upon the cross, Leviticus 17, 11. Jesus loved us so that he was willingly able to lay down his life for us so that we might be forgiven. Why was it that he died on the cross? Was it because he didn't have the power not to die on the cross? Remember Jesus' words, Matthew 26, 53. Do you think that I can't even at this present time call upon my Father and he will give me 12 legions of angels? Jesus could have called the angels and they would have saved him from the Roman soldiers and from the Jewish leaders. But he didn't call them. That was not what caused him to go to the cross. They didn't have the power not to. But rather it was because he desired to go to the cross. Because he knew that in going to the cross, he would be able to provide for us forgiveness for our sins. Hebrews 12 verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. It was because of the joy that Jesus could provide through dying on the cross that he was willing to be a sacrifice for our sins. Why did Jesus go to the cross? It was because of love for me and for you. Jesus never stopped loving us. In spite of the hardship, he had to endure. Jesus loved us. In spite of the pain he had to bear, Jesus loved us. In spite of the suffering he had to undergo, Jesus loved us. In spite of the cost he had to pay, Jesus loved us. In spite of the death he had to die, Jesus loved us. And even though we were sinners, Jesus loved us. Because of his love for us, Jesus paid the price that we could not pay for ourselves. The Bible says of Jesus that he was a ransom for many, Matthew 20, verse 28. He paid a debt that he did not owe, and we owed a debt that we ourselves could not pay. How did he pay it? He paid it with his own blood. Think about what it would mean to you to give your blood for something. Would that thing be important to you? Wouldn't it be true that you loved it as dearly as possible? As, as you could possibly love anything, you loved that thing if you shed your blood for it. Listen to what the New Testament says about the blood of Jesus. Revelation 1 verse 5 says, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Matthew 26, 28, Jesus said, For this is my blood of the New Testament, or of the New Covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Paul wrote, Ephesians 1, verse 7, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And Peter said this, 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. As we noticed, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And so Jesus was willing to shed his blood so that we could be forgiven of our sins. Paul, by inspiration, said this way, that Jesus made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. Because Jesus loves me, I have an answer for my soul's need for a sacrifice. Because Jesus loves me, I have an answer for my soul's need 
for salvation. We need salvation. We need to be saved from our sins and saved to a heavenly home. And Jesus and Jesus alone is the answer for that need. We cannot save ourselves. Luke 19 verse 10 says that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus understood our soul's need for salvation. And it was in loving response to that need that he came to the earth and died on the cross. Why? Because he desires that all men should be saved. 1 Timothy 2, 4. Why? Because he is not willing that any should perish. Why? Because he would have all of us enjoy life and enjoy it more abundantly. John 10, verse 10. That Jesus loved us means that those who were downtrodden could be lifted up. That those who are in darkness could see light. That those who are despised could know love. That those who were facing death could have life. Paul wrote Romans 6 verse 3 beginning, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Jesus came so that even though we are facing death in our physical bodies, we could have spiritual life in him. When Paul and Silas had preached the gospel in Philippi and had been arrested and had been beaten with many stripes, had been thrown into the inner prison, there to be held fast in the stocks. Do you remember what the text says, Acts 16, verse 25? It says, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God. Now, Luke doesn't tell us what song they sang. He doesn't tell us what the lyrics or the words of that song were doesn't tell us what the tune was. But I think we know what that song was about. I think that song was about the love of Jesus Christ and about the salvation that they had in Christ. I'm sure in some way that song was about this idea, Jesus loves me. Though they were facing such terrible circumstances, circumstances we likely will never face as Christians, circumstances in which they might even have feared for their lives, thought perhaps that they would face death, they were able to sing a song of praise to God. Why? Because Jesus loves us, and he is the answer for our soul's need for salvation. Finally, Jesus loves me is the answer to my soul's need for security. Jesus loves me is the answer for my soul's need for security. Surely we need salvation from our sins. But we also need security in knowing that we can continue in that saved relationship. So that if we so choose... There is nothing and no one that can cause us to be lost. There is nothing or no one that can, against our wills, take us away from Jesus Christ and take us away from our salvation. I know it's the case that some wonder about the love of Jesus when they face times of trouble, when they face times of temptation, when they face times of trial. There are times when we might ask, where is Jesus right now when I need him the most? Or times when we might say, if Jesus really loves me, why is he allowing this to happen? We should remember this. Jesus still loves us when we are down and out. Jesus still loves us when we are sick. Jesus still loves us when we are in pain. Jesus still loves us when we are lonesome. Jesus still loves us when we are neglected. Jesus still loves us when we are abused or oppressed. Jesus still loves us when we are overwhelmed by this life. Jesus still loves us when we are unloved by others. 
Jesus still loves us when we are helpless, afraid, or discouraged. Jesus still loves us when we are rejected and broken. Jesus still loves us when we are homeless. Jesus still loves us when we are crushed by the weight of guilt. Jesus still loves us when we are mourning over loss. Jesus still loves us when we are facing our own death. Listen to what Jesus said, John 10, verses 27 and 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. No man upon this earth has the power to pluck the faithful out of the hand of Jesus Christ. If we will live faithfully for him, we will have the home he has promised. We can be confident in that. We can trust that our souls are secure in the hands of Jesus Christ. Paul asked it this way, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he answered that there is no person and no power that shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, verses 35 through 39. That is real soul's security. That is the soul's security that is promised to us within Scripture. And because of that soul's security, we can live in hope of eternal life, Titus 1, 2. That word means that we can live not only desiring and eternal life, but expecting confidently that in Christ and through Christ we will enjoy that eternal life. We can live knowing that when the storms of life come, Jesus will be the anchor that holds Hebrews 6 verse 19. And we can live confidently knowing that even when death comes, he is the answer. In Jesus Christ, we know that if we die in the Lord, we will have rest from our labors and our works will follow us, Revelation 14, 13. In Jesus Christ and because of Jesus Christ, we know that even when we pass from this life, we will one day hear Jesus say to us, come you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. In Jesus Christ, we can say, that to live is Christ and to die is gain, Philippians 1.21. In Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone, we find the solution, the answer for our soul's need for security. What will come of my soul and what will come of yours? The only answer for that need is Jesus Christ. And it is found in those words, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. This is the answer. It is the answer for my soul's need. So when doubt comes, when fears threaten, when oppositions arise, when challenges face us, when temptations test us, when death claims us, let us remember that Jesus loves us. He loved us that we might, through forgiveness, put our sinful past behind us, that we might, by fellowship, know the wonderful and abundant blessings for God's people in this present time, and with the Father, know that glorious and blessed future life in our heavenly home. Jesus loves us. This is the answer that we need in our lives. There is no doubt about the fact that Jesus loves us. The question is, do we love Jesus? Jesus said this, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, John 14, 15. Do we love Jesus? Are we keeping his commandments in our lives? Have we kept the commandment to believe in Jesus as the Christ? the Son of God, John 8, 24? Have we kept the commandment to repent of our sins, to turn from them and no longer live in them, Luke 13, 3? Have we kept the command to confess our faith in Christ before men so that he will confess us before his Father in heaven, Matthew 10, 32? 
Have we kept the command to be immersed in water so that we might be saved? Mark 16, 15 and 16. And are we keeping the command to live faithfully for Jesus even to the point of death? Revelation 2.10. Jesus loves us. Do you love Jesus? Are you keeping his commands? Do you need to start doing that today? If so, we're ready to help you and we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing. seated. Our final song this morning will be song number 417, 417, after which we'll be led in prayer. Doso, walking in sunlight all of my journey.
Let us pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us the perfect sacrifice in our Savior Jesus Christ. We thank you so much for the promises you make because the promises you make, you keep. And Father, we're so thankful for the great, wonderful promises that you give us if we live righteously in this world and keep the faith that you will give us that heavenly reward. We pray, Father, that all mankind everywhere will reflect upon how they are living and what they need in this life to actually get that wonderful reward, which is only in Christ Jesus. We ask you to be with so many of our people who have troubles in this life, that lost loved ones are sick and ill, who are missing from our congregation at this time, that you will give them that cure that only you can give them. We ask you, so many of the travelers are with us today for whatever reason, you give them Godspeed, that they will return home safely and healthy. We ask you to be with each one of us this day that we always look to you for the righteous way to live. Help us be with so many of our Christian friends, be with our ministers all over, those who are in schools learning to preach the word of Christ, that the gospel will abound throughout this world like we've never seen before. Help us always be in your stead, Lord God. Help keep us safe and healthy. Pray the pandemic will end soon. We ask you also might send much moisture to this country for wildfires that abound. Help us always know that you are God and we are your servants and please give us the faith always to be what we should be. In Christ's name we pray, amen.